Chapter 25 The Whole Truth A slight gesture from Poirot enjoined me to stay behind the rest. I obeyed, going over to the fire and thoughtfully stirring the big logs on it with the toe of my boot. I was puzzled. For the first time, I was absolutely at sea as to Poirot's meaning. For a moment, I was inclined to think that the scene I had just witnessed was a gigantic piece of bombast, that he had been what he called playing the comedy, with a view to making himself interesting and important. But, in spite of myself, I was forced to believe in an underlying reality. There had been real menace in his words, a certain indisputable sincerity. But I still believed him to be on entirely the wrong tack. When the door shut behind the last of the party, he came over to the fire. Well, my friend, he said quietly, and what do you think of it all? I don't know what to think, I said frankly. What was the point? Why not go straight to Inspector Raglan with the truth instead of giving the guilty person this elaborate warning? Poirot sat down and drew out his case of tiny Russian cigarettes. He smoked for a minute or two in silence. Then, Use your little gray cells, he said. There is always a reason behind my actions. I hesitated for a moment, and then I said slowly, The first one that occurs to me is that you yourself do not know who the guilty person is but that you are sure that he is to be found amongst the people here tonight. Therefore, your words were intended to force a confession from the unknown murderer? Poirot nodded approvingly. A clever idea, but not the truth. I thought, perhaps, that by making him believe you knew, you might force him out into the open, not necessarily by confession, he might try to silence you, as he formerly si silenced Mr. Ackroyd, before you could act tomorrow morning. A trap with myself is the bait. Merci, mon ami, but I am not sufficiently heroic for that. Then I fail to understand you. Surely you are running the risk of letting the murderer escape by thus putting him on his guard? Poirot shook his head. He cannot escape, he said gravely. There is only one way out, and that way does not lead to freedom. You really believe that one of those people here tonight committed the murder? I asked incredulously. Yes, my friend. Which one? There was a silence for some minutes. Then Poirot tossed the stump of his cigarette into the grate and began to speak in a quiet, reflective tone. I will take you the way that I have traveled myself. Step by step you shall accompany me and see for yourself that all the facts point indisputably to one person. Now, to begin with, there were two facts and a little discrepancy in time which especially attracted my attention. The first fact was the telephone call. If Ralph Payton were indeed the murderer, the telephone call became meaningless and absurd. Therefore, I said to myself, Ralph Payton is not the murderer. I satisfied myself that the call could not have been sent by anyone in the house. Yet I was convinced that it was amongst those present on the fatal evening that I had to look for my criminal. Therefore, I concluded that the telephone call must have been sent by an accomplice. I was not quite pleased with that deduction, but I let it stand for the minute. I next examined the motive for the call. That was difficult. I could only get at it by judging its result, which was that the murder was discovered that night instead of, in all probability, the following morning. You agree with that? Yes. I admitted, yes, as you say, Mr. Ackroyd, having given orders that he was not to be disturbed, nobody would have been likely to go to the study that night. Très bien. The affair marches, does it not? But matters were still obscure. What was the advantage of having the crime discovered that night in preference to the following morning? 
The only idea I could get hold of was that the murderer, knowing the crime was to be discovered at a certain time, could make sure of being present when the door was broken in, or at any rate, immediately afterwards. And now we come to the second fact, the chair pulled out from the wall. Inspector Ragland dismissed that as of no importance. I, on the contrary, have always regarded it as of supreme importance. In your manuscript, you have drawn a neat little plan of the study. If you had it with you this moment, you would see that the chair being drawn out in the position indicated by Parker, it would stand in a direct line between the door and the window. The window, I said quickly, you two have my first idea. I imagine that the chair was drawn out so that something connected with the window should not be seen by anyone entering through the door. But I soon abandoned that supposition, for though the chair was a grandfather with a high back, it obscured very little of the window, only the part between the sash and the ground. No, mon ami, but remember that just in front of the window there stood a table with books and magazines upon it. Now that table was completely hidden by the drawn-out chair, and immediately I had my first shadowy suspicion of the truth. Supposing that there had been something on that table not intended to be seen, something placed there by the murderer, as yet I had no inkling of what that something might be, but I knew certain very interesting facts about it. For instance, it was something that the murderer had not been able to take away with him at the time that he committed the crime. At the same time, it was vital that it should be removed as soon as possible after the crime had been discovered. And so, the telephone message and the opportunity for the murderer to be on the spot when the body was discovered. Now, four people were on the scene before the police arrived. Yourself, Parker, Major Blunt, and Mr. Raymond. Parker I eliminated at once, since at whatever time the crime was discovered, he was the one person certain to be on the spot. Also, it was he who told me of the pulled-out chair. Parker then was cleared. Of the murder, that is. I still thought it possible that he had been blackmailing Mrs. Ferrars. Raymond and Blunt, however, remained under suspicion since... If the crime had been discovered in the early hours of the morning, it was quite possible that they might have arrived on the scene too late to prevent the object on the round table being discovered. Now, what was that object? You heard my arguments tonight in reference to the scrap of conversation overheard? As soon as I learned that a representative of a dictaphone company had called, the idea of a dictaphone took root in my mind. You heard what I said in this room not half an hour ago? They all agreed with my theory, but one vital fact seems to have escaped them. Granted that a dictaphone was being used by Mr. Ackroyd that night, why was no dictaphone found? I never thought of that, I said. We know that a dictaphone was supplied to Mr. Ackroyd, but no dictaphone has been found amongst his effects. So... If something was taken from the table, why should not that something be the dictaphone? But there were certain difficulties in the way. The attention of everyone was, of course, focused on the murdered man. I think anyone could have gone to the table unnoticed by the other people in the room. But a dictaphone has a certain bulk. It cannot be slipped casually into a pocket. There must have been a receptacle of some kind capable of holding it. You see where I am arriving. The figure of the murderer is taking shape. A person who was on the scene straight away, but who might not have been if the crime had been discovered the following morning. A person carrying a receptacle into which the dictaphone might be fitted. I interrupted. But why remove the dictaphone? What was the point? You are like Mr. Raymond. You take it for granted that what was heard at 9.30 was Mr. Ackroyd's voice speaking into a dictaphone. 
but consider this useful invention for a little minute. You dictate into it, do you not? And at some later time, a secretary or a typist turns it on and the voice speaks again. You mean, I gasped. Poirot nodded. Yes, I meant that. At 9.30, Mr. Ackroyd was already dead. It was the dictaphone speaking, not the man. And the murderer switched it on. Then he must have been in the room at that minute. Possibly. But we must not exclude the likelihood of some mechanical device having been applied. Something after the nature of a time clock or even of a simple alarm clock. But in that case, we must add two qualifications to our imaginary portrait of the murderer. It must be someone who know, knew of Mr. Ackroyd's purchase of the dictaphone and also someone with unnecessary mechanical knowledge. I had got thus far in my own mind when we came to the footprints on the window ledge. Here, there were three conclusions open to me. One, they might really have been made by Ralph Payton. He had been at Fernley that night and might have climbed into the study and found his uncle dead there. That was one hypothesis. Two, there was the possibility that the footmarks might have been made by somebody else who happened to have the same kind of studs in his shoes. But the inmates of the house had shoes sold with crepe rubber. And I decline to believe in the coincidence of someone from outside having the same kind of shoes as Ralph Payton wore. Charles Kent, as we know from the barmaid of the dog and whistle, had on a pair of boots clean dropping off him. 3. Those prints were made by someone deliberately trying to throw suspicion on Ralph Payton. To test this last conclusion, it was necessary to ascertain certain facts. One pair of Ralph's shoes had been obtained from the three boys by the police. Neither Ralph nor anyone else could have worn them that evening since they were downstairs being cleaned. According to the police theory, Ralph was wearing another pair of the same kind and I found out that it was true that he had two pairs. Now, for my theory to be proved correct, it was necessary for the murderer to have worn Ralph's shoes that evening, in which case Ralph must have been wearing yet a third pair of footwear of some kind. I could hardly suppose that he would bring three pairs of shoes all alike. The third pair of footwear were more likely to be boots. I got your sister to make inquiries on this point, laying some stress on the color in order, I admit it frankly, to obscure the real reason for my asking. You know the result of her investigations. Ralph Payton had had a pair of boots with him. The first question I asked him when he came to my house yesterday morning was what he was wearing on his feet on the fatal night. He replied at once that he had worn boots. He was still wearing them, in fact, having nothing else to put on. So we get a step further in our description of the murderer. A person who had the opportunity to take these shoes of Ralph Payton's from the three boys that day. He paused and then said with a slightly raised voice, There is one further point. The murderer must have been a person who had the opportunity to purloin that dagger from the silver table. You might argue that anyone in the house might have done so, but I will recall to you that Flora Ackroyd was very positive that the dagger was not there when she examined the silver table. He paused again. Let us recapitulate now that all is clear. A person who was at the Three Boars earlier that day, a person who knew Ackroyd well enough to know that he had purchased a dictaphone, a person who was of a mechanical turn of mind who had the opportunity to take the dagger from the silver table before Miss Flora arrived, who had with him a receptacle suitable for hiding the dictaphone, such as a black bag, and who had the study to himself for a few minutes after the crime was discovered while Parker was telephoning for the police. In fact, Dr. Shepard! Okay, JK, I'm not leaving either. 26. And nothing but the truth.
There was a dead silence for a minute and a half. Then I laughed. <laughs> You're mad, I said. No, said Poirot placidly. I am not mad. It was a little discrepancy in time that first drew my attention to you, right at the beginning. Discrepancy in time? I queried, puzzled. But yes, you will remember that everyone agreed, you yourself included, that it took five minutes to walk from the lodge to the house. Less if you took the short cut to the terrace. But you left the house at ten minutes to nine, both by your own statement and that of Parker. And yet it was nine o'clock when you passed through the lodge gates. It was a chilly night, not an evening a man would be inclined to dawdle. Why had you taken ten minutes to do a five minutes walk? All along, I realized that we had only your statement for it, that the study window was ever fastened. Ackroyd asked you if you had done so. He never looked to see. Supposing then that the study window was unfastened, would there be time in that ten minutes for you to run around the outside of the house, change your shoes, climb in through the window, kill Ackroyd, and get to the gate by nine o'clock? I decided against that theory, since in all probability a man as nervous as Ackroyd was that night would hear you climbing in, and then there would have been a struggle. But supposing that you killed Ackroyd before you left, as you were standing beside his chair, then you go out the front door, run around to the summer house, take Ralph Payton's shoes out of the bag you brought up with you that night, slip them on, walk through the mud in them, and leave prints on the window ledge. You climb in, lock the study door on the inside, run back to the summer house, change back into your own shoes, and race down to the gate. I went through similar actions the other day when you were with Mrs. Ackroyd. It took ten minutes exactly. Then home and an alibi, since you had timed the dictaphone for half past nine. My dear Poirot, I said in a voice that sounded strange and forced to my own ears, you've been brooding over this case too long. What on earth had I to gain by murdering Ackroyd? Safety. It was you who blackmailed Mrs. Ferrars. Who could have had a better knowledge of what killed Mr. Ferrars than the doctor who was attending him? When you spoke to me that first day in the garden, you mentioned a legacy received about a year ago. I have been unable to discover any trace of a legacy. You had to invent some way of accounting for Mrs. Ferrars' 20,000 pounds. It has not done you much good. You lost most of it in speculation. Then you put the screw on too hard and Mrs. Ferrars took a way out that you had not expected. If Ackroyd had learnt the truth, he would have had no mercy on you. You were ruined forever. And the telephone call, I asked, trying to rally. You have a plausible explanation of that also, I suppose. I will confess to you that it was my greatest stumbling block when I found that the call had actually been put through to you from King's Abbot Station. I at first believed that you had simply invented the story. It was a very clever touch, that. You must have have some excuse for arriving at Fernley, finding the body, and so getting the chance to remove the dictaphone on which your alibi depended. I had a very vague notion of how it was worked when I came to see your sister that first day and inquired as to what patients you had seen on Friday morning. I had no thought of Miss Russell in my mind at that time. Her visit was a lucky coincidence since it distracted your mind from the real object of my questions. I found what I was looking for. Among your patients that morning was the steward of an American liner. Who more suitable than he to be leaving for Liverpool by the train that evening? And afterwards, he would be on the high seas, well out of the way. I noted that the Orion sailed on Saturday, and having obtained the name of the steward, I sent him a wireless message asking certain question. This is his reply you saw me receive just now. He held out the message to me. It ran as follows. Quite correct. Dr. Shepard asked me to leave a note at a patient's house. I was to ring him up from the station with the reply. Reply was, no answer. 
It was a clever idea, said Poirot. The call was genuine. Your sister saw you take it. But there was only one man's word as to what was actually said. Your own. I yawned. All this, I said, is very interesting, but hardly in the sphere of practical politics. You think not? Remember what I said. The truth goes to Inspector Raglan in the morning. But for the sake of your good sister, I am willing to give you the chance of another way out. There might be, for instance, an overdose of a sleeping draft. You comprehend me? But Captain Ralph Payton must be cleared. Savant sans dire. I should suggest that you finish that very interesting manuscript of yours, but abandoning your former reticence. You seem to be very prolific of suggestions, I remarked. Are you sure you've quite finished? Now that you remind me of the fact, it is true that there is one thing more. It would be most unwise on your part to attempt to silence me as you silenced Mr. Ackroyd. That kind of business does not succeed against Hercule Poirot, you understand. My dear Poirot, I said, smiling a little, Whatever else I may be, I am not a fool. I rose to my feet. Well, well, I said with a slight yawn. I must be off home. Thank you for a most interesting and instructive evening. Poirot also rose and bowed with his accustomed politeness as I passed out of the room. Chapter 27 Apologia. 5 a.m. I am very tired, but I have finished my task. My arm aches from writing. A strange end to my manuscript. I meant it to be published some day as the history of one of Poirot's failures. Odd how things pan out. All along I've had a premonition of disaster from the moment I saw Ralph Payton and Mrs. Ferrars with their head together. I thought then that she was confiding in him. As it happened, I was quite wrong there, but the idea persisted even after I went into the study with Ackroyd that night, until he told me the truth. Poor old Ackroyd. I'm always glad that I gave him a chance. I urged him to read that letter before it was too late. Or let me be honest. Didn't I subconsciously realize that with a pig-headed chap like him, it was my best chance of getting him not to read it? His nervousness that night was interesting psychologically. He knew danger was close at hand, and yet he never suspected me. The dagger was an afterthought. I'd brought up a very handy little weapon of my own, but when I saw the dagger lying in the silver table, it occurred to me at once how much better it would be to use a weapon that couldn't be traced to me. I suppose I must have meant to murder him all along. As soon as I heard of Mrs. Ferrer's death, I felt convinced that she would have told him everything before she died. When I met him and he seemed so agitated, I thought that perhaps he knew the truth, but that he couldn't bring himself to believe it and was going to give me the chance of refuting it. So I went home and took my precautions. If the trouble were, after all, only something to do with Ralph, well, no harm would have been done. The dictaphone he had given me two days ago to adjust Something had gone a little wrong with it, and I persuaded him to let me have a go at it instead of sending it back. I did what I wanted to, and took it up with me in my bag that evening. I'm rather pleased with myself as a writer. What could be neater, for instance, than the following? The letters were brought in at twenty minutes to nine. It was just on ten minutes to nine when I left him. The letters still unread. I hesitated with my hand on the door handle looking back and wondering if there was anything I had left undone. All true, you see, but suppose I had put a row of stars after the first sentence. Would somebody then have wondered what exactly happened in that blank ten minutes? When I looked round the room from the door, I was quite satisfied. Nothing had been left undone. The dictaphone was on the table by the window, time to go off at 9.30. The mechanism of that little device was rather clever based on the principle of an alarm clock, and the armchair was pulled out so as to hide it from the door. I must admit that it gave me rather a shock to run into Parker just outside the door. I have faithfully recorded that fact, 
Then later, when the body was discovered, and I sent Parker to telephone for the police, what a judicious use of the words, I did what little had to be done. It was quite little, just to shove the dictaphone into my bag and push back the chair against the wall in its proper place. I never dreamed that Parker would have noticed that chair. Logically, he ought to have been so agog over the body as to be blind to everything else, but I hadn't reckoned with the trained servant complex. I wish I could have known beforehand that Flora was going to say she'd seen her uncle alive at a quarter to ten. That puzzled me more than I can say. In fact, all through the case, there have been things that puzzled me hopelessly. Everyone seems to have taken a hand. My greatest fear of all, though, has been Caroline. I have fancied she might guess, curious the way she spoke that day of my strain of weakness. Well, she will never know the truth. There is, as Perot said, one way out. I can trust him. He and Inspector Raglan will manage it between them. I should not like Caroline to know. She is fond of me, and then, too, she is proud. My death will be a grief to her, but grief passes. When I have finished writing, I shall enclose this whole manuscript in an envelope and address it to Poirot. And then, what shall it be? Veronal? There would be a kind of poetic justice. Not that I take any responsibility for Mrs. Ferrer's death. It was the direct consequence of her own actions. I feel no pity for her. I have no pity for myself either. So let it be Veronal. But I wish Hercule Poirot had never retired from work and come here to grow vegetable marrows.